Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Wednesday, April 10th, one year to the day when Lori Vallow's trial had openings. We just finished up with Chad Daybell's. Kind of ironic, don't you think? Before we get started, you know the drill. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Click on that little bell icon. Music fact of the day. I'm choosing this because if you know, you know. The Thunder Rolls by Garth Brooks. Tanya Tucker was actually the first to record this song. He has a third extra verse he does live. In that third verse, the victim of domestic violence shoots and kills her abuser, which caused CMT and TNN to ban that video. All right, so we had openings today in the Chad Daybell trial. Big thank you to the mods in my chat on YouTube for holding down the fort. I did a lunchtime live with Law and Crime. I'll be on there the rest of the week at lunchtime doing a q and I'll be a little late tomorrow. I have to take Grammy to the doctor, so I'll slide in and hop on when I get home. Thanks to everybody who joined as a member on YouTube and donated today. Appreciate you guys so much. That's going in my travel fund to get up to Boise as much as I can. So let's break down these openings. For the state, Rob Wood starts off with two dead children buried in Chad Daybell's backyard in September of 2019. Next month, his wife is found dead in their marital bed. 17 days later, he's photographed dancing and laughing on a beach in Hawaii at his wedding to Lori Vallow, his mistress. He thought he had a right beyond the ordinate when he had a chance at what he saw was his rightful destiny. He made sure no person or law would stand in his way. His desire for sex, money, and power led him to pursue those ambitions. That pursuit led to the deaths of JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. He is an author who has written books about the apocalypse. And during this trial, you will hear a story more troubling and the story is real. Love how Rob Wood laid this out. Chad Daybell, author, he does his openings in chapters. Chapter one, he was a seemingly ordinary man, worked as a journalist and a sexton. He married his wife, Tammy, in 1990, and they settled in Utah. Tammy was a full-time homemaker and mother. Tammy's love for her family was boundless. Together, Chad and Tammy started a small publishing company, which she supported in many ways. They had five kids together, and they moved to Idaho, where Tammy became a beloved school librarian. But Chad's life with her wasn't enough. Chapter 2, Lori Vallow. She was a homemaker from Arizona, married to her fourth husband, Charles Vallow. She was the mother to Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Tylee was a normal, vibrant teen who loved her friends, loved Chipotle, her Jeep, loved her little brother, JJ. JJ was on the autism spectrum. He required extensive special care, and he loved his sister. A pivotal date that set in motion their deaths, October 26, 2018. Chad and Lori met at a conference in St. George, Utah. They were both married. That introduction set into motion the reality you will hear about. You'll hear from the defendant in his own words. They had an affair. You'll hear his text revealing his mindset and his motivation. The texts reveal their story of lust and plans for a future together. He had a thirst for power, sex, and money. And Chad created an alternate reality. He called himself and Lori James and Elena, names from one of their past lives. Their texts show lust and plans for the future together. Chad wrote to Lori that he experienced a happiness unmatched in his 50 years. Chad was captivated by Lori's appearance. He said she was out of his league and how he was taken by her beauty and spoke about their sexual encounters. Chad's obsession with Lori was rooted in her admiration for him. He called her an exalted goddess. He told her in writing she had returned to Earth for a special mission. Part of that mission was being with him. They soon came together and turned their dreams into plans into the future, but there were obstacles. JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. Chapter 3. You'll hear the world they planned for themselves. They identified anyone who stood in their way as dark. Anyone who opposed them were labeled as dark spirits or zombies. It was a convenient narrative to dehumanize people who stood in their way, and they were labeled as obstacles. That gave them the pretext to remove people from their world for their own good. 
Charles Vallow had a $1 million life insurance policy. He was labeled dark and shot and killed by Lori's brother, Alex Cox. They would do castings and burnings and even death to cleanse these spirits. Chapter 4, Enter Alex Cox, Lori's devoted brother. Chad and Lori manipulated him with promises of spiritual rewards. They wielded their influence over Alex, drawing him into their plotting and planning of their own future. Chad gave a blessing to Alex, saying, You have already assisted us in ways that can never be repaid. But Chad and Lori text concerns back and forth that Alex could implicate them, and Alex knew that. Before he died, he told his wife, Zulema, he was afraid he was going to be their fall guy. Once they devised their calculated plan, it only took months to remove perceived obstacles. Charles was shot by Alex in Arizona, and Lori stood to gain $1 million to fund Chad and Lori's future. Following his death, she awaited a payout that never came. She found out she was not the beneficiary. Lori texts Chad, I'll get $4,000 for Social Security, and Chad says, it'll be interesting to see if it got changed after. He had two bullets in his chest. Tylee was last seen September 8, 2019. Her remains, charred and dismembered, were found in a grave on Chad's property. Lori illegally received Tylee's Social Security, which was provided to Tylee after the death of her father, Joe Ryan, Lori's third husband. JJ was possessed, according to Chad. His bound body was discovered in Chad's backyard. He was suffocated. Lori was still collecting his Social Security benefits. You'll hear from witnesses how Chad predicted multiple times that Tammy would die. Tammy was a vivacious, upbeat mom, but she was a dark spirit. October 9, 2019, there was an attempt on her life, and then 10 days later, she died in her own home. Chad had recently upped her life insurance policy, and he rapidly cashed in and looked for condos in Hawaii. You'll see the rental application, which indicates no kids. The medical examiner later determined the only reasonable way that Tammy Daybell died was homicide. Chapter 5, 17 days later, Lori and Chad got married, symbolizing what he called their eternal union. Planned before Tammy's death, Lori was shopping for rings while Tammy was alive. Without the obstacles and having Social Security money, they could live the life they wanted. But chapter 6, reality shattered their bliss. Two things led law enforcement to Chad and Lori's door. On October 2nd, Brandon was shot at in Arizona by someone he believed was in Tylee's Jeep. Law enforcement in Arizona contacted law enforcement in Idaho to look for the Jeep. Also, JJ's grandmother was concerned she had not seen or heard from JJ and requested a welfare check. November 26th, law enforcement arrives at her door. Chad said he didn't know her very well in spite of the fact they were married and in a relationship for a year. There were lies by Lori to police about J.J. and Tylee's whereabouts. They moved to Hawaii, and Lori didn't present her kids to law enforcement, which led to her arrest and extradition. The text to Tammy, where Chad talks about shooting the raccoon. You'll hear from the FBI agent who found that it was longer and more conversational than usual. When law enforcement went to his property in June, they didn't find a raccoon. They found Tylee's remains in the pet cemetery and J.J. nearby. Chapter 7 a timeline of major events. October 26, 2018, Chad and Lori meet. July 11, 2019, Charles Vallow is shot and killed. August 31, 2019, Lori, Alex, JJ, and Tylee move to Rexburg, Idaho. September 8, 2019, Tylee was last seen. September 22, JJ was last seen. October 2, the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreau. October 9, the attempted murder of Tammy Daybell. October 19th, the death of Tammy Daybell. And 17 days later, Chad and Lori marry in Hawaii on November 5th, 2019. November 26th, there's the welfare check on the kids. Sometime after that welfare check, between the 26th and the early morning hours of the 27th, Chad and Lori leave town. June 9th, 2020, the children's remains are found on Chad Daybell's property. Chapter 8, an outline of evidence to come. An overview from law enforcement. How it all began, pursuing their dreams, but the obstacles in their life, financing their life, unraveling the conspiracy, the forensic evidence, them being in Hawaii, the dissolving dream. You'll hear in Chad's own words, voice recordings, recorded phone calls with Lori and text between the two. Chapter 9, 
He reads off all the charges and said that it is yet unwritten. Two dead children buried in this defendant's backyard. The next month, his wife is dead in her bed. 17 days later, this defendant marries Lori Vallow. When the evidence of this trial is fully unfolded, we will have the chance to speak to you again, and we ask you to end this horrible narrative. So I thought it was a really strong opening. I love the chapter idea. You can't overwhelm this jury in those openings. They're not up to speed on the case like we are. So you have to give it to them in little bite-sized pieces. And I think Rob Wood did a great job of just an overview of why we're here. Next up was John Pryor, who, by the way, his favorite word is objection. We've already established that. Let's don't start a drinking game because we would all be in the hospital by lunch break. Pryor tells the jury facts and evidence are important. Don't be distracted by speculation, guesses, or hunches. He says Chad went on a mission early in his life, and when he returned, he started moving on in his life. He met Tammy. Chad had an extended engagement by his faith's standard. They dated six months, and six months is an extended dating process in their faith. They married in Utah and had children who are all adults now. They moved to Idaho and started a small publishing company run by Tammy. She was the brains behind it. They published books where Chad would write about his religious experiences and things that were consistent with his faith. He wrote about premonitions, good and evil, dark and light and death, and the end of times. And when a savior in his mind comes back, maybe some redemption. The books were fiction. The books were about adventures and crazy ideas of what kids and teenagers get involved in. In October of 2018, he was invited to speak about his book, which was not uncommon for Chad. While he was there to sell his books, he was in his booth promoting, and this beautiful, stunning woman comes up and gives him attention, pursued him, and encouraged him. She sat with him to help sell books. She had interest. After the seminar, there was no contact for months after Chad went on his way. Lori was a different story. She was someone who was married right out of high school, short-lived. She married again a few years later, again, short-lived. I tell you, I'm wondering if Pryor is not going to call some of her ex-husbands to the stand. Alex was Lori's protector. He would do anything to assist Lori in her endeavors. 2007, her third marriage, it was a bad marriage. She made accusations against Tylee's father and her brother Alex tased her third husband, Joe Ryan. When there was a problem with Lori, Alex came to the rescue without question to solve her problems. 2019, Lori still married to Charles. January and February, Chad had communication with Lori that turned into an affair. Yes, he engaged in discussions and contact with her. Charles was shot. Chad is not being pursued in Charles or Brandon's cases. 21 years of marriage with Tammy and Lori comes in the picture. She's a former Miss Texas, very sexual and manipulative. Pryor says that Lori drove Chad into a relationship. There was a murder and a burial. You heard about his backyard. It's four and a half acres. You'll hear JJ's body was found near a tree in a pasture. Maybe backyard, but really it's the pasture. Also in the middle was a former raspberry patch, which became the pet cemetery. You'll hear from a DNA expert. He says this is the one who got Amanda Knox exonerated. He will tell you about DNA evidence on scene. Fingerprints on the plastic J.J. was discovered in was Alex's. The hair found with J.J.'s body is Lori's. There were several hairs on J.J., but no DNA or hair of Chad on J.J. entirely. Dr. Raven, forensic pathologist, will tell you about Tammy. There's no indication this is a homicide or any other crime, and the only conclusion is you cannot tell the cause of death. They exhume Tammy Daybell. Three or four of Tammy and Chad's kids will testify about Tammy's health struggles, about how she would refuse to see a doctor and use homeopathic methods. You'll hear from forensic anthropologist Bartolink about the nature of how Tylee's remains were burned. Why wasn't there a whole skeleton? And essentially just uh, find my client not guilty, and that was it. First witness up, Detective Ray Hermosillo, been a fixture in this case since the very beginning. He identifies Chad right out of the gate. They were contacted November 1st, 2019 about a Jeep that was possibly in their jurisdiction that was involved in an attempted homicide. Of course, that's Brandon Boudreaux. Gilbert PD asked them to seize the Jeep and also gave Detective Hermosillo the townhome address. He performed intermittent surveillance. Intermittent surveillance is that they would go and watch when they had no other active calls. 
That surveillance was November 1st through the 4th, and on the 4th, he located the Jeep. He did see Chad there a few times at the townhomes. They show a photo of that Jeep. November 4th, they call Gilbert PD to let them know they had found the Jeep. Gilbert PD flies some detectives and crime scene techs to Rexburg to serve a warrant on the Jeep, also to get that infotainment center. They show birth certificates for JJ. They also show adoption papers for JJ and then the new birth certificate for JJ changing his name to Joshua Jackson Vallow. They talk about getting a photo of JJ from Kay. November 26, the welfare check. He saw Chad and Alex. He first had contact with Alex and asked if Lori was home and Alex said no. When Detective Hermosillo asked Alex if JJ was home, Alex looked surprised, looked at Chad, Chad looked at Alex, and they didn't answer initially. Again, he asked if JJ was home. Then Alex said he was in Louisiana. Detective Hermosillo said that's unlikely because his grandmother, Kay Woodcock, called in that welfare check. There was no response initially. Again, Alex and Chad just looked at each other. Detective Hermosillo asked Alex where he could find Lori, and he said apartment 107. He asked if there's a phone number to call. Alex didn't have the number, of course. At this point, they call in more officers to canvas the area. They realize something stinks here. He didn't speak to Chad at first, but he stopped Chad while Chad was driving away and asked when he last saw JJ. Chad said it was in October in Lori's apartment and JJ was with her. Detective Hermosillo asked for Lori's phone number. Chad said he didn't know her well and he didn't have the phone number, which Detective Hermosillo knew was BS because they were married. Another detective saw him talking to Chad and walked over. Again, he asked Chad for the phone number, and then he gave it. When asked, why didn't you give it to me the first time, Chad told the detective he felt that Detective Hermosillo was accusing him of something. They got warrants for the townhomes in the early morning hours of November 27th. When they went inside, everybody was gone. There were couches, there was food in the cabinets and in the refrigerator. Upstairs, there were beds. Seemed people lived there, but what caught his attention were there were no clothes on any of the hangers in the closet. Other things they found during the search warrant, old prescriptions for JJ, scooters, a small child's bike on the porch. They seized medications of Alex's. There was a child's suitcase. In Melanie's apartment, it appeared normal. There were no signs of JJ. And apartment 107 was completely vacant. In Melanie's apartment, they found large amounts of cash in a closet. They did keep that for safekeeping since they kicked in the door. Some of the items that were found in Lori's townhome. They found a ghillie suit, which is a camo you put on if you're hunting. Magazines for ammunition. Several different caliber guns. Suppressors and silencers. There were black trash bags full of clothes and papers. Different caliber ammo rounds. A rifle with the end of the rifle being threaded for a silencer. There was also another rifle found in a bag. There were several tactical knives, a loaded handgun, a very creepy Halloween mask, rope and duct tape inside a bag, Alex's passport, which was still active. There were printout emails from Chad to Lori with written notes on the printed emails, three of Chad's books, a white Apple phone. And at this point, their next step was to talk to anyone who would take their calls to try to find JJ. At this point, J.J. is who they were looking for, and they were exhausting every effort. They talked to Melanie's, they talked to Colby, and the scope of the search changed after they talked to Colby because he mentioned Tylee. They show a birth certificate for Tylee. They tried contacting Lori and Chad both by cell phone to check on the children, and they point out that neither one of them ever called to report the kids missing. They did get tips about the kids. When a tip came in, it would be assigned a tip number and they were followed up by a detective and other officers. Some of them were anonymous. November 20th, they have a first presser about the kids. Detective Hermosillo wrote the child protection action that was filed for JJ and Tylee, which ordered Lori to produce her children in five days. He learned of Chad and Lori's location in Hawaii at the beginning of January of 2020. They found out by witnesses who called in saying they saw them in Hawaii. He wrote warrants for cell phone data and geofence location, that also helped to locate Lori and Chad in Hawaii. Detective Hermosillo went to Hawaii January 24th, 2020. He went to aid and assist the Hawaii Police Department to serve that order to produce the kids. Lori was served on January 25th. They also executed a search warrant on the rental car and the condo. For 
June the 9th, 2020, the day they found the kids' bodies, they got to Chad's property around 7 a.m. They also had other units staged a mile down the road. They allowed Chad to sit in a recliner close to the door. His kids sat on the couch. They gave Chad a copy of the warrant, and he did read through it. They asked if they needed to leave. Chad was told he did not need to leave, but if he did stay, an officer would accompany him. Chad asked if he could make a call, so he went outside and made a call. He sat in his car on the west side of the house. Initially, he was on the phone, and as the call progressed, the phone was in his right hand, and Chad was looking over his left shoulder. Detective Hermosillo found this odd and wanted to see what Chad was looking at, so the detective maneuvered himself to see what Chad was looking at, and it was a perfect view of JJ's burial site. At this point, ERT, the evidence response team, were marking off different spots they wanted to search right next to the tree. The ERT team had marked off a six-by-foot section, and they started to remove that top layer of soil. They also removed a shrub. Graphic trigger warning here. We're going to get into what was found, although we did not get too far into this. At that point, you could see large white rocks, and as soon as they saw the rocks, they could smell the decomposition. After that, they slowly dig around these white rocks, which were eventually removed. They took photos and measurements, and below the layer of rocks were two pieces of thin wood paneling. Once they removed those, the smell got stronger. They could see discoloration of dirt. Above was dry dirt, and under the wood was wet dirt. They continued to brush away wet soil and could start to see a black round object protrude through the dirt. As they removed the dirt, this took the shape of the crown of a human head. The leader of the evidence response team got a small sharp instrument and made a tiny opening in the plastic. Under that was another white layer of plastic. They cut through that, opened it up, and saw brown human hair. Once they got to that point, Chad was sitting in his daughter's driveway, which is kind of kitty corner, to Chad's house. He left at a high rate of speed once they uncovered that first sign that there was a human body in his yard. He was pulled over and arrested. Detective Hermosillo went back to the burial site. They kept excavating around the plastic, and they ended the day with this testimony that they saw a small body wrapped in black plastic with duct tape around it. Very powerful way to end that testimony today. I'm very shocked that three or four of Chad's kids are going to testify. That blows my mind because everybody has said Tammy seemed fine. Um, I'm very curious to see who John Pryor has on his witness list. Are we going to see ex-husbands of Lori's? I think it was a strong day, obviously, for the state. They're really laying out the facts that they will continue to build around as this story unfolds for the jury, who, according to what they have sworn to, don't know very much about the case. So it's a lot to digest. The jury last year wrote a ton of notes. I think John Pryor is going to slow this trial down, and the second coming may happen before we get to the end, because he was objecting over photos coming in, he wanted names of who was in the house, taking photos, who was in there during the search warrants. It's going to be one of those trials where we hear a lot of objections and he's doing his job. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it's going to slow it down because we had a few sidebars. All right, guys, that's it for today. I'll be back tomorrow with another recap. Come join us. We'll be streaming live about an hour before court resumes. I'm going to hopefully hop on and talk to everybody like I did today. We have a really good group in there, great mods. So we'll see you tomorrow. Hope you have a good rest of your evening.